My name is Phil Hadley. I'm uh, International Director for AHDB. Uh, welcome to this webinar on EU exit and the red meat trade. We're expecting over 200 attendees today, which demonstrates the timeliness of, uh, of such a conversation and also the information that's contained in the speakers. Um, we have speakers uh, from the Danish uh, Bacon and Meat Council, uh, Meat Industry Ireland, and our own uh, policy advisor, Tanya, based in Brussels. So we've got a good range of speakers to give that view from, uh, from Europe and we'll get into the meat of the parade. But before we get into the uh, to the webinar itself, just a, a little bit of housekeeping uh, and the schedule for today. So webinar will end around 11.30. There'll be a formal question period and a discussion with the panel uh, towards the end. Please use the chat bar to uh, forward any questions ahead of that discussion panel later. You'll find the, uh, the questions bar in the right-hand side. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and published on YouTube, so you can access the details afterwards and share with your colleagues, revisit any of the uh, content. As delegates, you'll also stay muted throughout the uh, throughout the webinar, but please put your questions forward uh, through the chat. And then in the question session, uh, there will be a, a couple of surveys for the uh, uh, to support the discussions that will take place. And then there'll be a closing survey question to ask about um, how useful you found the webinar and feedback so we can tailor the context uh, of, of future webinars. So those are the, uh, those are the brief uh, sort of housekeeping rules. And with that, I'd like to move on to the first speaker, who is Tanya Esto Casas, uh, AHDB uh, policy manager, uh, who is speaking today from Brussels. So over to you, Tanya. Thank you very much, Phil. Hope you're hearing me uh, right. So, uh, yeah, as Phil said, I'm Tanya Gestasas and I'm the policy manager of the AHDB in the Brussels office. So today I'm going to provide a brief uh, state, um, update on the state of play of the EU-UK trade negotiations and I'm also to provide an overview of the main changes ahead for our exporters. So if we can go to the next slide, please, Amanda. Let's start with the state of play. Well, um, as you all know, the UK left the EU on the 31st of January and we enter the transition period that will last until uh, the 31st of December this year. Uh, this was possible because the two sides agreed on a pictorial agreement that is the legal text that sets the terms and conditions for the UK orderly exit of the EU. And one this um initial separation issues were solved uh now the, the the negotiators have been focusing on the future trade relationship so how um how the eu and the uk are going to trade with each other once uh, the transition period is so this is the phase uh, we are now on and the goal of these negotiations is uh, to agree on a zero tariff uh, zero quota free trade agreement that, as I say, needs to be in place by the end of this year, by the end of the transition. So, negotiations started in March 2020 at a very challenging time, obviously um, impacted by the ongoing pandemic. Nonetheless, uh, the teams in both sides managed to to have to hold nine formal rounds of negotiations and what progress was achieved during these nine formal rounds of negotiations? Well, there was progress on core areas of trade, uh, trade in goods and services. However, uh, significant divergences uh, remain on some specific areas, and these are basically the sticking points that are points that are hampering progress overall. This Specific areas um, are, of course, fisheries and level playing field and the governance uh, provisions. So, where are we now? Well, since uh, the 21st of October, uh, the negotiators went into an intensified uh, phase of negotiations. They've been meeting basically almost every day, uh, weekends included. Uh, and they've been working on the basis of a legal text. And my understanding is they progress, uh, they've made quite a lot of progress on this legal text. However, the big problem is, uh, remains uh, the same sticking points. 
and and the thing is that these are not this is not now technical issues these are fundamental differences on basic principles for both sides so that's why it's been uh, so difficult to, to find an agreement on those and another main problem and the second main problem if you wish is that we are running out of time um the agreeing a free trade agreement is just the first step then this agreement needs to be ratified and you know with only like slightly more than a month to go to the end of the transition the time frame for this ratification is getting tighter and tighter so um i wouldn't dare to say to, to try and predict what's coming next and what are the next steps but one thing is clear if we are to have a free trade agreement ratified by the end of the transition period we will need an agreement basically now in the next day so next slide please another thing that is clear at the moment is having a trade deal is still the best of the possible options for everyone and this is because you know a trade deal especially one that ensures duty and quota free trade is remains essential to, to, to be competitive in each other's market it can also a trade deal can also help reduce the amount of regulatory barriers between you know between the two uh, markets it cannot eliminate them there will be additional barriers but it can help reduce the amount of, uh, so it, it's always a uh, good help and then a trade deal is key uh, for a successful implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol, which is a very complex protocol to put in place. And it, it will be even more so if we don't have an agreement, uh, a trade agreement with you. That said, uh, what uh, a trade deal cannot do is change much of what exporters will need to do uh, to prepare for, for the end of the transition. And this is because uh, the EU, uh, sorry, the UK uh, will be leaving the EU single market and the customs union at the end of the transition period, and this will bring about unavoidable changes in the way we trade with Europe, regardless of whether we have an agreement or not in place. So now, in my following slides, I'm gonna I'm gonna cover these these new steps, but just a, a couple of disclaimers first. Um, this is by no means a step-by-step -step guide or an in-depth um, analysis of the different steps. It's just to flag out, uh, flag up the main issues, uh, the main new elements of the process. And uh, also just to say that we, I will be representing this always from a great Britain perspective. So from the perspective of experts going from Great Britain TV to, to the EU. I uh, will not cover Northern Ireland because, as I said earlier, this is a very complex issue that would deserve uh, probably a presentation on its own or several presentations even on its own. So, next slide, please, Amanda. So, uh, yeah, the first thing the UK needs is uh, to um, get the country listing. Uh, to ensure that it can still send products of animal origin to the EU after the end of the transition. When I say third country, I mean any country that is outside the EU and its economic structures. And the EU at the moment has a formal list of third countries that are approved for food imports. This list is based on sanitary and um, phytosanitary measures. And the aim is basically to make sure that they meet basic the basic EU standards. Um, so to continue selling meat to the EU after the 31st of December, the UK will need a third country listing, will need to be included in this list. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, the UK authorities have already uh, submitted the necessary documentation uh, for them for, for the UK to be included in the list, and uh, they are expecting EU member states states to vote on this application in December. So hopefully this will this issue will be solved very soon. Uh, next slide please. Then looking now specifically at the things that um, 
as the next steps or are the new elements for for exporters themselves so there there are a few things uh, that you can already check now you know that there will be changes you know in the process and some changes will come with the new year but there are some things that you can start checking now and among these things it's the URI number so uh, an URI number is an ID code for businesses used to track and register customs information in the EU and most businesses sending goods to the EU need an URI number if you don't have one you can apply for it online it takes around five days to get it and if you do have one please check that your URI number starts with GB because if it doesn't start with GB then uh, you need to reapply for a new one and as I say this is this number it's going to be necessary to send goods to the EU then another thing um, that you will need is to check whether your establishments are included in the list of approved establishment for exports of, of well, products of animal origin to the EU. And uh, this list, um, <coughs> excuse me, it's, this list is available online as well. So you can check there whether you are, uh, whether your establishments are included or not. Normally, all approved establishments have been automatically included, but if this is not the case, you can still notify this to the Food Standards Agency by the beginning of uh, December and they'll include you in the list. This is important because if you are not in the list, again, you won't be able to export the needs in this case to, um, to the EU. Um, and if the application uh, to be included in the list is done after the end of the transition, then it will take longer to be listed. So it can take up to 30 working days um, from January onwards. So it's important, it's good if you can review it now, make sure that you are in the list, and if not, notify it before the beginning of December. Then, um, after the end of the transition, there will be also significant changes uh, as regards the rules and requirements for health and identification marks and also for, for labeling. So one thing that you can do now is just check uh, the available guidelines uh, for both issues and uh, get familiar with the rules ahead of, of the end of the transition period. So if there's any issue, any implementation issue that you need to raise before you know before they become mandatory then you can get prepared now and finally last but not least uh, there is also um, a new requirement so any meat export to the eu uh, from january will be required to to have um, an export health certificate and i'll come to export health certificates in a minute but uh, exporters will need to manage and to apply for and manage these export health certificates uh, through an online platform, which is this EHC online platform. And you will need to register to get access to it. So the, the registration is something that you can also do, start doing now and you're not, you don't need to wait until the end of the transition. So next slide, please. Now. What are the main new elements of, of, this, of the process to export meat from uh, GB to EU after the transition period? So as I've just mentioned, uh, one of the main differences is the requirement of having an export health certificate. An export health certificate is an official document confirming that your export meets the health requirements of the EU. Getting uh, an export health certificate a fully certified export health certificate is a process in itself that needs to be planned ahead because you need, first of all, you need to apply for it uh, in a specific time frame. Um, then uh, you need to get your goods uh, physically inspected by a certifying officer. And if this inspection is successful, then this certifying officer issues uh, a signed and stamped export health certificate and then you need to make sure that a hard copy of this um, EHC travels with the consignment 
um, with, with your consignments to Europe. So as I say, you need a whole set of, you, you need to make sure you plan this well in advance so everything in place is in place when you send your consignment. Another thing that you will need to consider in your planning is border control posts. So border control posts are approved inspection posts at EU border that carry out checks on animals and animal products. So not all ports and airports in, in the EU have a border control post and not all border control posts accept all types of goods. goods. So your goods will need to enter the EU via a, right, uh, via a valid for the control post, so you need to make sure you plan this ahead. In addition, both the control posts require pre-notification of goods arriving, and this is something that will need to be done by your EU-based importer or the import agent, who is basically the person who is receiving uh, your goods in the EU. Then there are also a set of new permits and, and as, as you see also documentation and certificates that need to travel with the goods, with the meat in this case. So it's very important that the driver that is carrying your goods to Europe has all these permits because goods will not be able to be moved across EU borders without the correct documentation. So need a, to have good coordination with the person that is in charge of the transportation of your goods. Then another key new element is custom declarations. So from January 2021, exporters will have to submit export custom declarations and also safety and security information. You can do this yourself, but custom processes are complicated, uh, require specific training and software. So you can also hire someone uh, to do this for you if you feel you don't have the capacity to, to do it yourself. And then uh, my last point is on uh, tariffs. Obviously, this depends on the outcome of the of the agreement, but we need to be aware that if we don't have an agreement in place by the end of the transition period, then exports to the EU will also be subject to tariffs. So you will be also um, you will also be charged tariffs when sending uh, your products to the EU. So next slide, please, Amanda. So what will this all mean? Well, as you see, there's an increased volume of documentation and formalities that will be required for export purposes. And this obviously will have implications on the speed of business transactions that will obviously decrease. You will also have less flexibility due to all the need to comply with these different deadlines and processes and so on. And this obviously have an impact, will have an impact on the cost and even the commercial viability of some of your operations. So I need to consider this very carefully. There will also be new risks, um, as if any, if there's any failure in any of these steps that I've just mentioned, you, you are probably risk to be rejected in the border or delayed um, somehow, with the, obviously the subsequent costs. Then in this context, communication will be key. So you need to make sure your your partners you know sending sending you know your partners in the export uh, so to say are well aware of all these new requirements and they they have the permits and the documentation so everything runs smoothly so communication with agents with colliers will be key also with customers because obviously the rules of the game are changing and this will have an impact on the services that you can provide. So um, making sure that your customers understand that you are now operating under different rules is also key. And then, as I said earlier, a trade deal won't solve everything, but if at least it can avoid having tariffs on top of everything else, then it's already uh, not a bad, not that bad outcome. So uh, please, Amanda, next slide. And this is just my last slide. As I say, this was just a, a brief overview to flag up the main issues, but you can find additional information online. The EU exit website um, 
in in the AHDB website has the links to all the different uh, uh, government guidelines. And we've also created recently a new um, page focusing specifically on meat producers and exporters. So feel free to have a look at that. Then we are also participating in the EU Exit Food Hub, which is an excellent platform where you can find uh, loads of um, yeah, answers to frequently asked questions in terms of changes ahead. And then DEFRA, uh, they've been uh, hosting a series of webinars explaining the new steps um, step by step. Uh, so, uh, if you haven't had a chance to, to join one of those webinars, you can access our recording online and that's uh, in the link there and, and these links will then distribute to all of you uh, after the webinar. So, yeah, lots of information there and, um, and I'm going to finish here, but if you uh, have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you uh, very much, Tanya. You, you outlined the key process steps there. There's obviously a lot to think about and a lot to get ready for, and we'll come on to levels of preparedness uh, during the discussion uh, and the round table. Just remind people, as Tanya did there, that there's a question box on your uh, on your toolbar. Please put in your questions there, and we'll hope to address them within the uh, within the discussion. So, thank you, Tanya. The next speaker is. Good Paul from uh, a director with the Danish Bacon and Meat Council is going to give a, a, a Danish perspective, particularly around the pig meat sector. So thank you, Nud. Uh, welcome your presentation, please. Thank you very much, Phil, and thank you for the invitation to participate today. Uh, as Tanya said just in the beginning of her speech, uh, the 31st of December is approaching very fast. And I would not exclude that they will not finish the negotiations. Uh, they will, in the last minute, <clears throat> agree to make a further postponement uh, with the reference to the problem we had with Corona this year, not allowing for good negotiations to go on. Uh, but regardless, if uh, the date is the 31st of December or the 31st of March or the 30th of June, uh, the Brexit will happen and uh, we will have to see what is the impact uh, to the meat industry. That is the question to me. And frankly, the uh, short answer is I don't know what the impact is, but of course uh, we can put up some likely scenarios. Uh, so please, next slide. Um, so uh, the four scenarios uh, we can look at is <clears throat> that we have no deal. <clears throat> We have a hard Brexit and uh, the UK will apply uh, full MFN tariffs like the EU will do. And that's what the UK have announced they'll do in that case. Uh, we can also happen to have a free trade agreement uh, with uh, zero or low tariffs on pig meat. And I'm only addressing pig meat here because I know Cormac will address the beef later. Uh, then we can also have the scenario uh, that uh, the UK uh, is having a hard uh, Brexit with us, uh, but like they offered last time when there was a postponement, they will not use the full MFN duty uh, because that might impact uh, the food market too much. Uh, so last time they offered lower than the MFN uh, on pig meat, and that could also be the possibility this time they always have the right to do so. And then the last scenario I'll address uh, is that uh, the EU and the UK do not agree, but the UK agree uh, trade deals with other uh, major uh, agricultural exporting countries. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, just to remind, uh, before we go into the scenarios, uh, the importance of the pig meat market uh, for uh, the rest of the European Union. Uh, the UK has a relatively low degree of self-sufficiency in pig meat, uh, so uh, between 55 and 60 percent uh, of the uh, consumption of pig meat in the UK is imported, uh, and uh, that's around 1 million tons a year which is a significant uh, quantity. 
and uh, the main uh, suppliers uh, is uh, the neighboring countries, so to say, uh, Germany, Netherlands, Ireland, and Denmark. <clears throat> and uh, of course, there is a long uh, relationship uh, between uh, the suppliers and the processors and the retailers in the UK. Uh, so uh, most of uh, the import is in the form of fresh chilled products. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, so uh, to compare uh, the relative importance, uh, the EU 27 uh, had an export of 4.5 million tons of uh, pig meat uh, to the third countries in 2019. Uh, it means that uh, when we then look at the 1 million tons from the UK, uh, that the UK will be a very important supplier uh, uh, sorry, important export market for us uh, relatively to other export markets. Next slide. As you can see on that slide, there's a lot of numbers here, but what you just have to notice is that uh, <clears throat> you can see that all other third countries are 4.5 million and the UK is 1 million. Uh, the UK will be uh, the absolute uh, uh, significant number two export markets for the EU after China and Japan will be number three. Uh, so we go into the scenarios now. Uh, next slide. Uh, so uh, the first scenario I mentioned uh, were that uh, we have a hard Brexit, that uh, we uh, immediately uh, then have uh, a, a much more expensive import in the UK due to the high tariffs. So even though tariffs are relatively low in pig meat compared to other products, it would mean that the import would be between 30 and 40% more expensive. Uh, and uh, it would have uh, a lot of uh, consequence. Uh, we believe that uh, this uh, kind of increase will have some uh, uh, reduction as a consequence to the UK consumption. Uh, and uh, depending on what is the price elasticity, you will see a decreased uh, import uh, from, uh, from uh, the uh, uh, EU countries uh, to the UK. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, that also means that on the EU market, uh, we will have uh, much more uh, meat uh, to deal with uh, because uh, uh, besides uh, the pork uh, staying in the EU, not going to the UK, there'll also be beef and other products uh, in that scenario. Uh, so we will see a, a difficult uh, market situation in, in, the, in the EU if it, uh, it, it comes uh, to that uh, situation. Um, <clears throat> Uh, if uh, it's a long-term situation, uh, we might see a increase in the domestic uh, production in the UK. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is just to illustrate what I said before. You can here uh, uh, look at what is the MFN duty on pork, and then I compare it uh, to the actual values of the Danish export figures. Uh, and then you can see we are in that high uh, relatively level, <clears throat> 30 to 40 percent. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, if we have <clears throat> a free trade agreement uh, between the EU and the UK, uh, we assume that we will have very low or zero tariffs on pig meat. So basically, that means that there will be no change. Uh, of course, we assume that uh, the standards uh, and uh, uh, everything else remain the same. <clears throat> of course, there will be, <clears throat> as it was uh, addressed uh, by Tanya, uh, there will be uh, some customs formalities and document formalities, <clears throat> and they are complicated when you look at them. Uh, but I think uh, we should not uh, exaggerate that point. We are exporting uh, to more than 100 different markets <clears throat> with more difficult infrastructures uh, than uh, we believe uh, they are in the UK. So after some time, uh, we will uh, get used to that. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> 
So uh, that is the scenario I mentioned if we have no deal, uh, but the UK choose not to apply MFN, uh, but a lower uh, tariff because that is a right. If we look at what they uh, offered in 2019, that was four to seven percent. It will not have a big impact on the pig meat export to the UK. It will have some impact, of course, but it is then something which is in uh, the range we are used to uh, due to currency uh, fluctuations. So we don't think there will be much change. Of course, this uh, lower duty will be the same towards all exporters in the world, also towards Canada, the US, and so on. Uh, but uh, when it comes to competing uh, in pig meat with the US and Canada and others, uh, we are uh, relatively competitive in Europe. That's also why we're able to export and compete on many different markets, compete with those guys. Uh, and I can see that when we look at the Canada EU free trade agreement, they have a tariff quota of 75,000 tons for zero duty. And it's hardly not used uh, because it's difficult for them to compete uh, on the European market. Uh, of course, if you're looking at it from a domestic UK point of view, this uh, small duty will give a slight advantage to the UK production, but I don't think the great picture will change much. Then we come to scenario four, <clears throat> uh, which is what I would call the worst case scenario uh, for me, because that's a situation where we have no deal with the UK uh, and we have MFN duties of uh, 30 to 40%. Uh, whereas the UK go into an integration with North America with uh, duties there, with no duties there. Uh, and uh, that would mean that uh, the uh, price advantage of looking towards the US and Canada would be so big that you start to change the trade infrastructure and distribution system in the UK. And that will, of course, uh, push us out uh, of the market for a great part of our export. Uh, so uh, also looking at it from a domestic UK point of view, uh, it would mean an enormous pressure on the UK farmers if you integrate with the North American market instead of with the UK market. Uh, this integration would of course also require that the UK accept the uh, uh, hormones, uh, ractopamine, antimicrobial treatment, and so on. Uh, I think that is maybe the most unlikely scenario. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, what uh, does all this mean? Uh, it's difficult to, uh, to, to address it all in 10 minutes as foreseen, uh, but I think uh, the bottom line is that whatever meat is produced will be sold. And if we can sell less uh, to the UK for one of the reasons I mentioned before, then it would either uh, stay at home in the EU 27 or depending on market possibilities uh, outside Europe, it will go to other third country markets. And uh, all those are a lot of different parameters who are in, in, in variation all the time. Uh, we can address that uh, uh, when we come uh, to the round uh, later. And then uh, to keep within the time frame, the last uh, slide, please. Uh, uh, we are prepared uh, as well as we can be. Uh, we know that there will be more paperwork to fill out. We know that uh, our authorities have to make many more certificates. Uh, so therefore, uh, the Danish Food and Veterinary Administration have already employed uh, more people uh, to be able to do enough paperwork so we have no bottlenecks there. Uh, there can, of course, in, in the, uh, in the uh, beginning uh, be some bottlenecks in the harbors and so on. But as I said before, I don't think we should overestimate uh, the red tape, uh, the paperwork and so on too much. Of course, it will be an irritant. Uh, we're not used to it. Uh, when trading uh, with the UK, but we're used to it when trading uh, with uh, with uh, more than 100 markets, and a lot of them are, I believe, uh, more difficult uh, in that uh, uh, regard uh, than the UK. 
so I thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Nod. I guess it's a sobering uh, to see the level of trade between the EU and the UK and the potential disruption there. And uh, you ended on a note uh, reiterating Tanya's point, really, the complexity and the preparedness in terms of uh, certification and so on. It, it's, a, it's a hurdle we're going to have to overcome um, in order to, to continue trade and it to reflect the type of uh, paperwork that goes on for third countries at the moment. But it'll certainly be a learning curve. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nud, for your presentation. And I'll pass to our final uh, speaker now before we go into the uh, question panel. And again, remind you about the question bar uh, on your uh, toolbar. Um, it's Cormac Healy from Meat Industry Ireland, uh, Senior Director. He's going to talk a, a similar lines to Nod on the impact of the trade in Europe, but more from the ruminant sector and beef uh, sector point of view. So over to you, Cormac. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Phil, and uh, good morning to everybody. And thank you to AHDB for the for the invitation this morning to to take part in this webinar. And as Canuda said, unfortunately, we're not exactly coming with uh, total certainty and answers on all issues. Uh, we'd hoped at this stage. Uh, of probably the third deadline in this in this process that we would have the answers, but uh, regrettably we're still we're still waiting on on our politicians to resolve the the overall issues. Uh, next slide, please. As Knud has said, um, uh, you know I will concentrate more on the on the beef and lamb side, and I suppose in particular on on beef and the impacts uh, that you know we see uh, either through a no deal scenario or a or, or a deal scenario. Uh, on the European Irish meat sector uh, and, and principally looking at beef, as I said, and some of the implications that, that are obviously there for, for the UK side as well. I look at some of the challenges and opportunities as we see them uh, at the moment uh, and then maybe say a few words around preparedness. And within that, one of the issues of preparedness is for us, certainly, uh, and I know Tanya mentioned this in her opening presentation, is the whole area of market diversification to markets outside of, of Europe and the challenges and opportunities that are there. And finally, then I'll touch on uh, maybe a recent report that our, our overall food industry uh, association that we're part of has prepared in uh, in the last week or so in terms of setting out again to government uh, some of the principal asks and, and highlighting the impacts on our, on our sector. So next slide, please, uh, Amanda. So I, I think this slide, I, I use it to to maybe, you know, go back to the point that Phil just touched on the massive, you know, uh, impact that there there is potentially for, for the meat sector in Europe. Uh, and that all stems from the fact that the UK market is such a, an important part of, of, uh, of the European meat market from various aspects. Uh, and just picking some of the figures here, and they're, they're not the most up-to-date figures, the self-sufficiency ones I think are, but just to take a few figures that, that really bring home the, the relevance of the UK market. I mean, in terms of market size, UK accounts for about 15% of the overall EU market. And as you can see, is a major importer. It is 80% uh, uh, self-sufficient, so it, it does have a major uh, import trade on lamb. Uh, it's even more important in the European context, accounting for at least 30% uh, of, of European uh, lamb production and the lamb market. Uh, and it, in, in that trade, it's, it's both an importer, an important importer and exporter uh, of lamb. And as, as Knud has said, hugely important in, a, in to the, the European uh, pig meat sector uh, as, a, as it imports close to a million tonnes of, uh, of product each year. I use the um, the, the self-sufficiency figures just to make a few points. And looking at beef, uh, I mean, the EU 28 beef market, uh, as we stand at the moment, uh, is about 103% self-sufficient. Uh, if we take the UK out of that market mix uh, and look at the EU 27, suddenly our self-sufficiency is 116% which is really a massive shift in, in the market balance uh, and really is a market in oversupply and therefore potential for serious problems. On the lamb side then, uh, I suppose if you look at the EU27 with the UK out of, of, of the market, our self-sufficiency in that EU27 block uh, falls from 95% to 85%. So you could potentially say, well, is there some 
you know, are there some opportunities there uh, for for other European lamb uh, producers? But equally, there's it's a major issue for for UK uh, processors and and exporters. So I suppose the takeaway here for us is that the UK is hugely important in the overall European market scene. And the trade with the UK, both inwards and outwards, is very important to, to overall market balance. And if we are in a no-deal scenario, as, as, as Knud has referred to, uh, that does include tariffs uh, and possibly TRQs, but then we will have significant implications for our trade. Next slide, please. And one of the things our European organization, meat organization, UECBV, prepared a report back, I think it was in 2017, in the aftermath of, of the Brexit decision, just looking at that hard Brexit um, uh, scenario, as we talked about it then, but it's effectively a, a no-deal scenario. Uh, the impact on, on trade uh, was, was deemed uh, extremely, extremely significant. I mean, looking at, at beef, you were seeing falls in, in trade of up to 90% either way between EU and UK and vice versa. And similar substantial uh, impacts on trade flows um, between the UK and the EU for the other meat species. I mean, overall, uh, it, was, it was seeing a collapse in trade and a major imbalance in EU markets. Next slide, please. And, and from an Irish perspective, I suppose, just to bring, bring that uh, dimension into it, obviously we have described ourselves, and I'll come back to it later, uh, for our food sector, it's probably one of the most exposed sectors uh, to Brexit in one of the most exposed member states. And if we look at the potential, if the UK uh, and the EU fail to ar arrive at a deal and the UK uses the tariff schedule that the government has proposed at the moment, uh, the tariff bill is colossal on, on uh, current Irish meat exports to the UK. Uh, for beef alone, you're looking at a, a, a tariff bill, a new tariff uh, a new cost in, in trade of over 700 million euros uh, and the overall meat trade with the UK uh, our tariff bill running to uh, over 900 million which is colossal and uh, nobody I think would uh, imagine that it can be trade as normal in that scenario there would be you know increased import price uh, into the UK uh, but equally erosion of export value for Irish exporters and knock-on implications for producer prices in, uh, in, in Ireland. Next slide, please. And one of the, one of the things recently uh, during the year, uh, the Irish government had a study undertaken by Copenhagen Economics, again, looking at the impact of Brexit in both the deal scenario where we secure the FTA between EU and UK and also the no deal scenario where the UK might operate at, at WTO uh, tariff levels. Uh, and the impact here on beef and our beef sector in terms of output uh, is pretty significant. I mean, it's talking about up to a 14% drop in output. So in the medium term, a uh, pretty significant impact on, on the, the business here. Obviously, you know, uh, animals born last spring, animals born this spring coming are in the system. So there's not going to be an immediate supply adjustment, but the, the forecasts were for a significant impact on overall output. But similar impacts, not to the same extent across in, on dairy, uh, on the dairy sector, and also on the uh, pro, pro, prepared consumer foods sector. Next slide, please. So just to look maybe at some of the <clears throat> challenges and opportunities, I mean, the, 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 the scale of, of, of the impact, depending on what is our outcome, uh, whether it's, it's the uh, deal scenario or no deal scenario, uh, the scale of, of impact will, will obviously vary greatly. We are, I mean, in looking at the challenges, we, we, we are still faced with uncertainty and all the businesses and people I'm sure on the webinar uh, are, are, are very conscious of that. We haven't had clarity on, 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 on matters yet, and we await something in the coming days, hopefully. Uh, and, and that uncertainty has clearly been exacerbated throughout the year by everybody having to struggle with the impact of, of the COVID pandemic. The major issue for us, uh, as, as Knut has also outlined in the worst case scenario, is that there is a no deal and we see imposition of tariffs in, 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 on both sides, which would greatly impact business flows. Um, but even with a deal, we equally know that uh, there will be additional costs to our business uh, in terms of administration, paperwork, uh, certification, etc. 
Uh, and as, as Knut has said, I mean, and, and struck a positive note, I mean, we, many of our exporters are, are dealing with many markets and therefore there's a capability there. But nevertheless, we're, we're bringing in a level of cost uh, and additional administration and disruption to uh, trade flows that have been running very smoothly and developed over the years. We still have concerns, obviously, on certification issues. There's many of them to be resolved, and I think it's something we might touch on later in the in the questions and answers. And for Ireland, uh, uh, the land bridge issue uh, is a particular concern, probably because you know the vast majority of our exports to continental Europe will transit the UK using the land bridge, and there are still serious concerns in relation to uh, uh, what will happen to that route and there is a lack of capacity on the direct route for, for exports and shipments to, to the continent. And then in the medium term, uh, the potential for obviously for increased competition in the UK market, uh, in, in an ODIL scenario, what we see is uh, you know, tariffs being applied to a, an EU trade where they didn't before. And for non-current, non-EU suppliers into the UK market, they actually see some level of reduction. So uh, you know, the competitive position does shift, and that's obviously a concern. Opportunities might be hard to come by in, the, in, 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 in talking about Brexit, but I mean, I suppose looking at, at the positives, you know, it's UK is still a major deficit market in, on, 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 uh, on meat, uh, particularly on beef. Uh, we are, from an Irish perspective, uh, continue to be a surplus producer. Uh, and there is a very strong and established trade in, in, in fresh chilled. And we would hope that proximity, quality, tradition and strength of relationships will, will serve us in the, in the, uh, in the months and, and years ahead in terms of retaining that position in the UK market with the right outcomes on a, on a trade deal. And I think positively, too, there's a, there's a good UK sentiment uh, towards, towards Irish food uh, and in, in surveys that Bordia has conducted in, in recent times. So demonstrated that. And then we all have to continue to look at uh, uh, market diversification, which I'll touch on uh, a little bit further. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. On preparedness, and we will discuss this in the questions and answers, so I won't dwell on it. This is a, a, an infographic produced by Board Bia based on work with many of the Irish food companies. Some of the stats are positive there in terms of uh, work that companies are doing, but I do, and I come to it in the in the questions and answers. I do still have concerns about levels of preparedness uh, on on various aspects uh, in terms of of the potential for delays that will arise on that land bridge issue and on some of the certification issues. Next slide, please. So just on, I mean, part of the preparedness and and since uh, 2016 and the Brexit decision. I mean, there's been a focus on diversifying and, and, and needing to reduce reliance from an Irish perspective uh, on, on UK market. And, and if we look at the table here, it's just looking at the share of our exports and in various uh, products to the UK market over the last five or six years. And on the right hand side, you see on, on, on milk and, and some of the dairy products, you can see the falling percentage of, of share of the UK market um, that it represents for, for their exports. So they have made progress there. But at the very bottom, uh, the bottom line of this table, uh, you, you can see that the volumes, the overall volumes of exports of dairy products from Ireland have been increasing substantially in that post quota era. Uh, so you are, you know, you are probably still seeing the same volume of product going in while the share is falling. On the beef side, though, the figures are not as as significant. I mean, okay, there has been a shift from a situation in 2016 where about 56% of of product uh, of beef was going to the UK uh, to the first half of this year, where 47% is going. So some shift. But it is a big challenge. Market diversification for beef is, is particularly challenging. Uh, it's a long, drawn-out process in terms of access to, to, to new markets, and it really is a long game. Uh, next slide, please. And we can roll on. So I'll just talk. Uh, you can move on to the next slide. Just in relation to that report I mentioned, and it's my, my final slide. Uh, as I've said, I mean, this is a report that our Food Drink Ireland uh, produced in the last couple of weeks. Uh, again, it's highlighting to government uh, that for the Irish food sector, we are the most exposed sector in the most exposed country. 
uh, under a range of headings in, in terms of our, our, our trade with, uh, with the UK. So what were the asks and what are the asks at this point in time? Obviously, we all want to see a deal being achieved. But in terms of some of the asks that were set out in that report, uh, I mean, firstly, we talked about a continuation or, or, or preservation of the employer wage subsidy scheme that we saw introduced as a mechanism in the in the early days of, of the COVID pandemic this year. Uh, but that potentially, in a worst case scenario, is something that needs to be considered for the food sector. Uh, secondly, we also we also need to see an export credit insurance scheme brought into place. We are looking at diversification. We are dealing, I suppose, with customers, especially across the food service sector in UK and across Europe and elsewhere, that are under pressure because of the pandemic. Uh, and we do need an export credit insurance scheme. It's an area that Ireland is lagging behind many countries, uh, the UK included. We're looking for uh, investment in, in uh, capital expenditure, in air capital investment in our processing sector, uh, supports and, and grants in terms of further investment in competitiveness. Market diversification is also being pursued. And th there are supports in, in, in the system. Our government has indicated that it has set aside 3.5 billion towards Brexit supports. Uh, there is an EU Brexit adjustment fund of 5 billion. We need to look at what has the potential within that. And the final piece within that was if there are tariffs brought into place, uh, well then, you know, is there the potential for some sort of tariff support mechanism to be introduced? After all, tariffs are simply taking revenue out of the out of the commercial chain. Uh, but I suppose, you know, finishing on that point, I mean, the first thing, and it comes back to what Knud said too, we don't have the clarity or the answers as of yet. The first thing we all have to see is in the coming days, uh, will there will there be a conclusion of uh, of a, a free trade agreement uh, between both sides that would substantially lessen the impacts for all of us concerned? So thank you very much. Thank you, Cormac. Great great job there, really, in stressing the importance of uh, of the UK to the marketplace, particularly the Irish uh, beef supply, and and you know some scary numbers there around the tariff cost uh, and the potential impact on the sector in terms of that. 14% output. So, you know, again, a very, uh, very sobering picture from uh, from the Irish uh, perspective in terms of potential impact. So, thank you. Um, I'll ask all our speakers now to pop their uh, cameras back on, and we'll head to the uh, to the roundtable um, discussion um, part. So, again, I, I can see a few questions here. Please feel free to. Uh, pop your questions in, uh, and we'll uh, we'll try and pick those up or, or come back to you on some of those areas. Um, everybody's touched on levels of preparedness for their industry. So it, what we're going to do now, just to take a moment, is to ask delegates to fill in a short poll. Amanda, if you could launch the poll to ask you about your your own personal business level of preparedness, that will help sort of inform some of the discussion. Uh, that goes forward. So I'll just leave that on the screen for a moment. If as delegates you can click on the options there, how prepared do you feel for the changes that are ahead? And the speakers have done a good job of outlining some of those uh, challenges coming up. Not prepared, somewhat prepared or very prepared against the backdrop of the information you have at, at present and appreciate there'll be some gaps. Um, so if that poll's live now, um, if you can fill that in, uh, we'll uh, we'll come back to the answers and share the answers uh, as part of the discussion. But um, so back to the uh, speakers. Then we've been talking about the level of preparedness uh, across the industry, uh, and perhaps I can ask you, uh, Cormac and Nud, to comment on how you feel or how your sectors feel they're prepared for um, for what comes next few weeks time so, that, so perhaps not if you'd like to answer that first yeah uh, <clears throat> I can say that uh, since we don't know what option will come up as the final solution uh, you can never be 100% prepared but we are prepared to be prepared uh, and um, uh, I think we're on a very good level um, uh, as I said before uh, we are used uh, to uh, all kinds of import systems uh, throughout the world. And of course, it is an additional cost, 
but uh, our experience is that uh, although it's looking frightening, then when you get it scaled up uh, to uh, uh, some import quantities of significance, uh, it is not too big a burden. In comparison yeah. to try to other third countries, similar yeah. similar level of, uh, of of burden. Yeah, we don't expect it to be more. Yeah. Okay. Actually, less. Okay. I suppose, well, I suppose what I'd say, I mean, uh, I mean, while while there is that experience, as Knut has said, of 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 exporting with. Uh, to to many uh, international markets and and their, the complexities associated with that, um, we're still looking at a massive shift in terms of the scale of our product. I mean, so you know, if if we're talking about forty five to fifty percent of our beef volume that goes to the UK, uh, and in recent years our exports to third countries uh, has has been in the region of ten percent. So we're now looking at bringing. Uh, a very substantial additional new administration burden uh, onto, you know, close to 50% of your product. So there is a, there is there is a, quite an impact there. I think companies, you know, our, our members and our main exporters, you know, they have customs familiarity. Uh, they they have been engaged, uh, you know, they have with 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 the authorities in terms of trusted trader status and. Uh, authorized economic operator. They've do, they've done these things, and and that's positive. They have reacted to these. They have their EORI number, etc. Uh, they have looked at IT systems uh, in in terms of a, a engagement with revenue and uh, and our own Department of Agriculture. They've equally been, I, I would uh, uh, take it in in a lot of contact with customers and talking to customers about about this. But you know that's ramping up. I mean, the number of questions now coming through from our own members uh, in relation to issues associated with the logistics around Brexit uh, are are increasing rapidly now because there's there's uh, the, the the focus is really is really coming onto things. I, I have. Concerns, uh, as I as I outlined in in the Irish situation, the fact that we have uh, used and relied so much on the land bridge route to the EU, um, there are still major issues there for us. I think because we've all heard about the expected chaos uh, in 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 Dover and the Dover Calais route, etc. Um, so there are there are issues there, and there are still areas that we're waiting for clarification from our own authorities or from the EU authorities on the procedures uh, around that. There's a number of areas we all know um, for, for both UK uh, exporters and importers and, and for European uh, operators too around export certification. It's still an area that needs to be fully clarified. We all want to see uh, if we do have to have it, which seems inevitable, uh, we want to see uh, as, as simplified uh, and reasonable a certification process as as possible between between UK and and, and the EU, um, because that will bring further burden and further burden for for the authorities as well. Um, so so I mean those are some I mean I think there's still some serious concerns uh, and there will be some headaches. I, I think the fact that the UK government has indicated in the short term uh, that it would it will not be requiring export certification and checks on animal pro animal products until the 1st of April i suppose that does give some some leeway uh, on that um, but on the flip side uh, uk exporters will be faced with it uh, in from from the 1st of January uh, from the preparedness of our authorities and i'm just speaking from an irish perspective i know that there's been a huge amount of, of work gone into uh, Dublin port, which would be the main uh, uh, entry point for, for exports from the UK. Uh, and at the end of the day, while Ireland might export about four and a half billion euros of food to the UK, it's more or less an equivalent figure in food exports coming back the other direction in, in perhaps more prepared and, and, and uh, um, uh, consumer products. But there's a huge inflow of, of trade from the UK into Ireland as well. And, uh, you know, I've, I've maybe been kicking our own department recently that they've been doing so much work in terms of figuring out smooth import flow um, uh, that they need to clarify some things for me on the export side as well. But there is a lot of preparedness there on that, on Dublin port. 
uh, on the level of staffing on on new facilities in terms of checking and that. So I think it's 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 worth noting that as well. But I I still I still expect um, a busy time in January. Let's say Phil, if that's the case, unless the deferral that Canute knows about uh, uh, is uh, takes place. Well, <laughs> it, it will be a, a busy time when whenever it happens. Uh, and you're right that when you add substantial quantities on top of the third country export you have now, you have more to administrate, and in particular uh, among the ex, uh, ex authorities in the exporting countries, there will be uh, a bigger workload. Uh, and uh, we have been in, in a lot of discussion uh, already since one year with our government. Uh, and uh, they have uh, decided uh, to employ more people uh, in the export departments uh, in the uh, veterinary administration. So they have sufficient manpower uh, to handle this additional certification uh, burden. Uh, so we hope to have eradicated one of the bottlenecks there. But of course, uh, there will be uh, uh, for the first uh, few months, uh, we will experience, I'm sure, bottlenecks somewhere. But uh, I also believe that those bottlenecks on the UK side will be repaired. Um, but we, we will have uh, uh, some transitionary uh, challenges. Uh, but uh, long term, I, I, I don't worry too much on that point. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, you know, you, you, you sort of said that point that you see a short term disruption for the first few months, perhaps. I yeah. mean, you seem relatively positive in terms of the short term disruption that will get resolved and trade will continue um, going forward after those issues have been ironed out. Yeah. I think the most important thing for us is uh, what kind of duty system and quota system and so on we will be faced with and not least uh, are we on a level playing field uh, with our competitors uh, from the rest of the world or yeah. are we even on a better playing field uh, than level uh, because we get a free trade agreement uh, that's the key questions uh, and I mean, all the speakers have highlighted the potential for tariff costs and disruption. Some of those numbers are pretty huge. Uh, and and on top of that, there's the operational costs, as you said, both from a governmental perspective and from a business perspective of facilitating the paperwork and the documentation and the checks and all that additional cost that goes with servicing a, a new system, whatever that ultimately looks like in, in the coming um, in the coming weeks. I can see within the question panel, we've got a number of quite specific questions around ongoing certification and so on. We might pick up one or two of those, but some of them we might have to refer uh, refer them on to um, uh, one of our UK government departments, such as AFA or DEFRA, to, for a bit more clarity, because some of those points just aren't clear uh, right now, and I suspect we won't be able to, to answer them within the uh, uh, within the questions. Cormac, you were uh, going to say something before, before I hand uh, over. Can I, can I ask you to also, within your, your answer now, say a little bit more about the land bridge? You've touched on the land bridge and goods transferring backwards and forwards and on to Europe. Could you just expand on that a bit more? Sure, sure, Phil, thanks. Um, no, I, I mean, I was, I would agree with, with Canute. I mean, the issues, the logistic issues, the administration issues, the customs and, and, and SPS checks, we will in time um you know uh, manage all of those it, it will be busy at the beginning there will be headaches and there will be disruption but you know the meat industry and meat traders and meat processors have faced many changes to their their operations and their regimes and have 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 shown an ability to adjust to those but it will take some time uh, uh they're, they're they're you know the tariffs are the one that really will will have the greatest impact if 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 that arises and i should say i mean in relation to the tariffs when i presented the figures on on the scale of that tariff wall if you if you like uh, uh based on the current uh uk tariff schedule i suppose the one aspect of that 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 hasn't been um clarified yet is whether or not the uk government might 
also operate some tariff rate quotas uh, within that tariff schedule. We know in an earlier version of its tariff schedule, it had talked about particular tariff levels, but also some tariff-free quotas. So that that hasn't yet been um, been clarified. I I know you mentioned export certification. I mean, I I think the reality is that you know any progress in in resolving the technical issues around certifications from both sides just seem to be frozen at the moment uh if that's not a pun because i know there's issue with children's as well but the the progress is is uh frozen at the moment i think until there's clarity on the deal uh and hopefully with a deal then we get to sort out these technical issues around certification as, as quickly as possible uh, and as i said from our view from our perspective and i think canood would probably be the same we want to see as 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 simplified a process of certification as uh, as as possible the the land bridge um situation well obviously with with probably 90 percent of what we export to continental europe in in terms of food uh goes goes via the uk um we still have to clarify uh from the from brussels really i suppose what we will require in terms of certification for that particular operation will we as we are going out of the eu transiting uk and back into the eu will we require a particular certification process for that will we require containers to be sealed um those have yet to be fully clarified to us uh, and we're becoming very anxious and uncomfortable about that because as i said perhaps you know with a deal uh the the flow of of trade between the uk and ireland for example in january uh would would take place relatively um unaffected i think because you know the tar the the certificates and the checks are not going to come in until first of april but from first of january we have land bridge issues um so apart from all of the delays we're looking for clarity around what we actually uh require in terms of certification we also know that for exporters from ireland we're going to have to pre-register consignments with our Department of Agriculture on the traces system. I know the UK has an equivalent system coming into effect to, to mirror that traces system. Uh, we have, our exporters will have to uh, pre-register with, with customs and put the product into a transit procedure. Uh, and in, in line with that, we will also, exporters will also have to have a guarantee in place with uh, revenue in terms of uh, to cover tariffs that potentially if the product didn't go on to the EU and went to the UK, there's need for cover on, on potential tariffs. And there are still some things to be clarified as to what we need to do with the UK authorities in terms of that product transiting. So there's, there's, a, there's a list of questions, uh, Phil, I'm afraid that are still outstanding. Yeah, I mean, I can see that in the questions that are coming up, some specific questions on some of these points. And, and the reality is right now, it's not entirely clear uh, on how you can answer them because they, they remain unanswered. And I'm sure I'll just come to Tanya now that your comment, uh, Cormac, around uh, level of questioning concern, uh, you know, the realisation of some of these unanswered questions has become increased. Tanya, I know you've you've seen a lifting the questions that you might want to touch on that point and also flag up some of the resources around the brexit or, uh, available to support uh, levy payers yeah indeed uh, so we are recently seeing you know an increase obviously on the questions we are getting as regards some of the practicalities and this is obviously a sign that people are just you know looking at the challenges and looking at what they need to prepare so just in terms of, of the, your initial question on what's the level of preparation in the uk well i think it's it, in reality it's it's a, it's a mixed picture where you get the the bigger businesses uh, who have you obviously the staff and the resources were relatively well prepared where the small to medium businesses who have less staff resources are obviously finding it hard to you know to, to get ready for all the things that you know need to take into consideration still as um in all cases as Cormac says um and as we've been discussing 
nobody's 100% prepared because there's still a level of unclarity uh, in, in some areas. However, as, an, as I highlighted in my presentation, there are some things that we do know and there are some guidance, avail guidance available. So uh, one of uh, the, yeah, one of the places or one of the resources I always highlight for, you know, exporters that are trying to get ready is, is the EU Exit Food Hub, which is a platform. I, I've mentioned it in my presentation, but it's basically a platform. Um, it is a, a website that is created by a number of partner organizations, including the AHTB, but much others in, in other sectors. So definitely worth having a look at that because there's a list of frequently asked questions. So most, most of the times you, you'll find that, you know, the question you have or the doubt you, you have has been already been asked by others. So definitely have a look at that. And the AHTV has also um, a new web page uh, focusing specifically on meat export, uh, on yeah, advice for meat exporters. So uh yeah there there the, the guide there's some guidance there but obviously we can only guide on on what we know and there is as, as we have been discussing still uh, some gray areas that need to be clarified yes yeah and, and I, again you know that thing comes through in terms of prepared and, and preparing for what we we did uh uh, a few weeks ago, a, a survey asking about level of preparedness, and we did see a whole range of responses to some large businesses that felt relatively well prepared and smaller businesses, generally speaking, that felt less well prepared. But an overriding question there was, to, with the information we have now, we don't really know some of those areas in, in terms of what's needed of us. So it, it is the unknowns, if you like, uh, which is probably a good point to ask Amanda to demonstrate the results of the first poll around people's feeling of prepared. Yeah, so I, I suppose that, that's to my point really, the somewhat prepared is, is businesses uh, probably feeling that they've done what they can do with the level of information they have at the moment, um, not feeling totally prepared because some of those questions are still not answered. Nord Cormac, would would you agree that would be uh, the view of you? Perhaps if your industry were represented here, those figures look about what you'd anticipate. Yeah, I would. Um, I would, Phil. I mean, looking at the survey that Borbia had done of of uh, food exporters, um, I, I think you know one of the figures was ninety two percent had reported you know some progress in the previous three months or whatever in terms of their preparedness. But then you went into figures where people were 50 or 60 percent were the figures in terms of engagement with customs and uh, engagement with their customers around uh, customs duties and things like that. So I would say very similar type um, figures um, being reflected there. And unfortunately, well, you know, we know we cannot. I don't believe there's any preparedness that you can have for a no deal scenario uh, with the with the scale of the the tariffs that are there. That that that's a different ball game. But I I think I think that people are working on the uh, engagements with with customs. Uh, we will in the in the next uh, week two weeks be doing a lot more in terms of certification issues with our own authorities and trying to get the clarity from from them uh, and from Brussels around that certification process. Uh, I, I still think there's a lot can be done in that regard in, in the in the period of time we have ahead, but there's a there's there there are many things to be clarified yet. Okay. Thanks uh Koma. Okay, perhaps we'll go on to the second poll now if we can which is around um, a, a question for the delegates and their commercial businesses, the priority destinations for your exports. We've, we've talked uh, now around the issues surrounding ongoing trade uh, with, with Europe. Uh, this is about what's the destinations for, your, for the volume of your exports. And as a result of that, is there a change uh, and a push to to broaden out to other countries. Cormac, you, you touched on growing export markets uh, in overseas areas. So perhaps we'll, we'll just leave that question there for a moment and ask people to 
uh, tick the box to identify where their destination is currently, and then we'll talk about broadening opportunities beyond Europe for uh, for the next part. Do you want me to okay. come in, Phil? Yeah, if we can just close that poll off, Amanda, when people have had a chance to uh, to comment. So we talked about um, we talked about Brexit and the potential to grow to other third country markets. Those countries that are reflected there are fairly broad brush, but represent where AHDB as an organisation has been scaling up and focusing its activity to try and broaden out as part of a part of a plan that was not necessarily predicated on, on Brexit, but uh, clearly to grow our third country exports, recognising EU still remains pivotal and critical, as it does to us all. Perhaps I can ask you uh, to comment on where you think those, you know, where the efforts are going on further afield from Europe to try and push um, from a ruminant beast side and, and nudge from a pig meat side. Nudge, can, I, can I come to you first yeah. to talk about yeah. the Danish? Uh, Ambition. I think, I think uh, the questionnaire you just uh, put up before, that was more the questionnaire about UK exports to the rest of the world. It was, and yeah. Your question to me is, uh, what are we as EU exporters expecting? Uh, yeah, and exactly. uh, of course, as I said before, this will impact uh, trade. Uh, and uh, my bottom line is that uh, whatever is produced in Europe will be sold. And if one channel is being reduced in the case of a hard Brexit, uh, then we will have to find other channels of selling. If uh, there is no obvious alternatives, uh, then uh, the selling is inside Europe, which means lower prices in Europe. If uh, we have a uh, uh, opportunity uh, to replace what we lose in the UK with new opportunities in Asia, uh, well, then that's what I have going to happen. Uh, but uh, again, it's a picture uh, where there is a lot of variations. Uh, it's not a static picture. If, for example, we have a combined uh, hard Brexit uh, with losing export opportunities uh, to Asia, uh, that uh, will be a very, very uh, tough landing. Uh, we have seen uh, recently uh, a very difficult situation on the European pig meat market because now we start to see the impact of a major European export of Germany uh, losing around 1 million tons of exports to Asian countries, in particular to China. Uh, and uh, that is uh, difficult to uh, divert. Uh, so here we have a uh, uh, a situation also uh, when we look at uh, the impact of the Brexit, uh, will the in Brexit be a hard Brexit and will that uh, coincide uh, with a Mercosur uh, deal being implemented, uh, causing additional quantities of beef and poultry being unloaded in Europe, uh, then the whole meat market really get under pressure. So it's, it's not a static picture. Uh, uh, but for sure, uh, in the case of a hard Brexit, uh, we will uh, be impacted. Uh, in the case of a hard Brexit uh, with a soft uh, duty, less impacted in the case of a uh, free trade agreement, uh, the impact will be least and it's only down to the red tape we talked about before, but that will be uh, smoothened out. So it's not a, a question uh, where you can uh, give an easy answer because everything is in variation. Nothing is static in this industry. The sure thing is uncertainty. <laughs> yeah. Okay, C Cormac, your uh, your view? Yeah, I, I suppose. Um, firstly, if you were putting up that poll um, to to our Irish exporters, we'd obviously have UK in there because there's a there's very much an ambition to continue. The trade links with the UK and to 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 continue uh, uh, servicing that market. Um, in terms of diversification, um, I suppose one thing you have to the starting point is that it is more challenging for uh, for EU beef and lamb than it is for pig meat. Just from a price competitiveness perspective, our pig meat is is more uh, competitive in global markets than perhaps our beef or or, or lamb and. 
the same probably the same does go for for the UK. But we continue to to uh, to target various markets. Um, but it is a slow process, and I was looking back at, you know, since since the June 2016 and the and the Brexit uh, decision, and obviously a further emphasis and focus uh, on on uh, getting further access for Irish beef in in uh, and lamb in in international markets. I mean, yes, we've we've secured China. Um, uh, the US, we secured the grinding beef. Um, Canada, we got access to in or about that time in 2016. Um, but that's really it. Maybe the Ukraine as well, not not a major outlet for us. So, I mean, it has been slow progress, uh, Phil, I suppose, is the point. We've continued as well as looking at new markets to try and improve uh, the conditions on certification arrangements for many other markets. We're continuing to work on, on South Korea and try to progress our access there uh, to Thailand, to Vietnam, these markets. But it is slow progress. And I suppose a point that, that uh, and I know the UK has made progress in, in recent times in relation to, to China, uh, you know, we, we had made good progress. Unfortunately, on the beef side, we're out at the moment because of, of, our, of the protocol that we have and suspension of trade with uh, China in May of this year due to a, an atypical BSE case. And that's going on now since May, despite our authorities having put back the full report and details, uh, we still haven't seen that resumption of trade. Uh, and a point that I've heard Knud made, make on, on numerous occasions, and it's a very relevant one, uh, we, we're we pushing uh, at Brussels level and pushing on, on the, the Commission uh, to get more active and more involved on the access agenda um, for many countries, but for, for China in particular, because when you look at the conditions uh, that European exporters have for access to China versus, for example, the US, uh, there's, there's a, a huge disparity. I mean, we're still on the beef side looking at under 30 month uh, boneless beef. Uh, we have no cover for offals. Uh, we've no cover for bone in products. Uh, the plant certification process and the plant approval process for China, as you well know, uh, is extremely tedious. I mean, we have to have inspections and individual plant approvals, whereas the US on the other side has, has got multiple plant approvals uh, overnight. It has a far uh, a more beneficial um, approval in terms of its exports and the the the, the products uh, that it can export so these are you know there are huge challenges as 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 AHCB knows as well uh, in 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 this um, access agenda but we continue to we continue to push on it and and our you know our as I said our priorities at this point in time is resumption of business with with, with China on the beef side uh, with with progress with South Korea and Vietnam and markets such as as that and on the lamb side we continue to push uh, in relation to US access and China uh, also they're the two largest global importers uh, of of uh, of sheep meat and at this point in time effectively EU lamb and EU sheep meat doesn't have access to either of those destinations yeah I mean we're, we're very aware of that uh, Cormac and I, th I mean, I take your point and agree entirely that market access, broadening opportunities, is uh, is a uh, you know a good thing. But the complexity and the time that takes, and sometimes the fragility of those markets, um, means that uh, they they're going to remain a challenge. They're not easy wins, and they're not without their own specific uh, difficulties. I, I guess the the results of the poll that you can see there are not unexpected, really. That the majority of the the delegates their businesses are focused on europe but they're now looking at other areas presumably just to mitigate and manage some of that risk um so i think that's uh, we share that position U europe remains critical for the ongoing trade and and like uh, yourselves uh, and uh, uh, and nord we've uh, explored and diversified other opportunities but and the level of uh of trade particular in the ruminant sector and sheep meat especially remains very uh, Europe focused because of the size of the market and the history there. And th those new markets take a long time to build as well, of course, into meaningful trade. So, okay, we can we can take the um, the poll off the screen. Thank you to the delegates for um, uh, for filling in their their thoughts. I'm just mindful of the time, and we're coming to our closing point now uh, in terms of our our, our schedule. Um, 
I think we've had a really informative discussion around the, the, the key key challenges and the issues. Clearly, some of the issues are we, we don't know where the landing point is. Uh, and we probably won't find out uh, for the next, well, hopefully we find out uh, soonest, but it, there's still a few weeks to go, of course. Perhaps it might be worth just taking a, a very briefly 30 seconds from each of the speakers to think, you know, what are the key concerns right now? And uh, what do you see the, uh, the, the the big single issue that, that keeps you awake at night? So I'll work from my screen left to right. So, First, Cormac, and then Tanya, and, and we'll finish with Nud. Is that question uh, other than Brexit, <laughs> Phil? No, it's a, it's perhaps the single biggest one. Is it certification? Is it cost? Is it tariff? Or is it a bundle? I, I would have to say the single biggest issue has to be uh, tariff. And do we get a deal that avoids tariff and TRQs? Uh, as we've said, I think, throughout, the other issues are impediments, their hindrances, their cost. But we can we can work on those. We can streamline them. We can manage them. The real issue would be would be tariffs, both in terms of the initial hit on the market and and, and trade, and also how you know how that could substantially change the competitiveness uh, position in the UK market. If if you know if we see tariffs rising on EU exports into the UK and potentially falling uh, for other suppliers from international markets. Yeah. Okay. Tanya. Sorry, I was so muted. Um, so it, it's a difficult to provide a single answer to that question. I think it's, it's a mix of different factors that need to be taken into account. Definitely what Cormac has just said, um, yeah, the potential of, um, impact of not having a deal will be huge. But hopefully, um, you know, in addition to that, uh, we would have to add also the level of preparedness uh, for the UK industry because for the UK it's not only about the trade with EU, it's there's so many other things that are going to change. You know, we are facing changes in act policy, in labour policy, you know, it's just such a wide uh, spectrum of changes that we are going to face that I think is just getting prepared and getting certainty around all these issues that uh, we will have to kind of uh, juggle them. So, yeah, okay. it's, it's a mixed no, it's question, mixed answer. Yeah. Okay, Nod? I can make it short. Terrys, Terrys and Terrys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you for the brevity there, Nod. You, you helped me as chair. Um, so, I mean, I think that's a fascinating discussion. It could clearly, uh, it could clearly continue for some time uh, in, in terms of the insight that the speakers have added to the discussion. There are some questions that I think we've picked up some of the points uh, as we've gone along. Uh, if there's anything specific that's outstanding, we'll come back to that and contact the uh, uh, the delegates directly if we can provide an answer. And some of those questions are unanswerable at the moment. Um, so. You know, from an AHDB point of view, this has been a, a, a fascinating website a webinar, rather, in terms of the discussions. And we remain uh, servicing our levy payers, servicing our stakeholders, particularly on the export side of things, um, in trying to continue to support our EU trade through the teams uh, uh, based in France and across Europe, and further afield in those other markets you saw, America. Uh, China, Japan, US, etc., where we see the, the, the market growth potential. Uh, so please, if you've got any questions for the team on the, our longer term uh, activities in those regions, uh, reach out, particularly in light of COVID. Um, all these presentations will be available on the website in the next 24 hours with a link so you can revisit the content and share with your uh, colleagues. I'll flag up another webinar that's occurring next week around uh, steps that have been taken to, to mitigate the risks around COVID uh, and disruptive trade that's taking place next Thursday at 11 o'clock, which will have speakers from the Animal and Plant Health Agency, uh, ourselves and um, uh, DEFRA or FSA type to talk about uh, uh, ongoing control and risk mitigation in that space. Um, so with that, I'd like to uh, thank all the delegates for their attention and attending and particularly like to close by thanking our three speakers here who shared their insight and thoughts. Some of those questions are not answerable at the moment, but I think we've had a really good discussion in terms of what the current situation is 
uh, and hopefully where we might get to in continued trade going forward and the potential risk here in terms of the disruption because it's it'll significantly uh, alter the the, uh, uh, the shape of what we do going forward so thank you all for your uh, for your efforts and your time today I hope our, our delegates have found that a really useful informative exchange so on behalf of AHDB I'll draw this to a close and, and thank you all thanks thank you bye 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 bye, -bye.